Plum Jim. Man, what a place for this interview today. It's kind of seen better days, that's for sure. But all the history in here, all the games, man, before the Stan Sheriff was built, this place was it. The Fab Five, yeah. And remember all those volleyball games? The fans in the stands shoulder to shoulder and <laughs> sometimes sweating just about as, as much as the, the people that were playing the games. Yeah, you know, it's some memories. Aloha, I'm Paul Udell. For many years, I was an anchor and a reporter on the mainland and here in Hawaii. Well, I'm retired now and a volunteer over at Alelo to help with a new program that's called Getting to Know You. Our guest today is the new athletic director, Ben Jay. And this is an appropriate place to do that interview because he has some high hopes, high dreams for this place. Thank you, Ben, for agreeing to talk with us uh, a little bit and find out here. a little bit more about you. I want to start going way back because when, when I heard about this, to tell you the truth, I was very shocked and it had to do with your grandparents in China. Could, could you tell us about that? Well, I, I mean, our family story goes all the way back to a little village in China uh, outside of what was then Canton, now Guangzhou, you know, and, and where, my, uh, where my parents uh, came from. And, the uh, story uh, that has been passed down is, is that uh, my grandparents on my father's side had uh, some jade jewelry of which they were keeping for their hopeful uh, new daughter-in-law one day. And, and when the villagers and the relatives found out about it, uh, my uh, grandparents uh, got turned into the communists. And from then on, they were ostracized uh, by many of the folk in the village. And, and, uh, and it was to the point where eventually they committed suicide. 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 So I've been able to go back a few years ago for the first time to go see the village and go see their grave, which uh, for many years was nothing more than just a big mound of dirt uh, in the forest behind the village. And with a lot of incense sticking out, it was the only marker at that time in all the photos I'd seen. But since then, uh, they, the villagers had actually brought in concrete and poured uh, kind of little concrete shells around the mounds in order to give it uh, its distinct location. So I was uh, able to visit the uh, burial site and, and uh, come and to terms that. with that. I, I, I still, in some ways, I've come to terms with it by being there. Um, I didn't, you know, any time when you've had suicide in the family, you, you wonder what, what drove them to it. But when you re look at our family history and, and, and things and you see what a proud family we have like that, it, do, it does make you wonder. So your father is sent with his uncle at the age of about eight to this country. Yep. Your father then serves in the military, yep. comes out and goes to work near Columbus. Mm -hmm as a, a it, worker in a, in a Chinese laundry? Yes, it is. It's, he's working in my uncle's laundry. And then what happens? He yep. grows up and he works in the laundry. He opens up his own. Well, he eventually took over the laundry from my uncle um, and, and became his own business. Uh, it, it, uh, that place that, at 1135 North High Street in Columbus, Ohio, and, and that's where my brothers and I grew up uh, as young children. And, and so uh, it's, a, it's a place that my older brother and I would remember well. Then he, your father uh, begins a grocery store, learns to become a butcher, mm -hmm. and you worked there from an early age? I, I, you know, my, my parents bought this grocery store and we moved there when I was six. And uh, at the beginning of age eight, I uh, began working in the store. You know, it's a family business. Everybody has to pitch in. And my parents always worked long hours as it was, and, and, uh, and the kids had to also work in the store. So my older brother John, uh, myself, and eventually my younger brother Dan uh, all worked in the store. What part did athletics play in your family? You know, in my family, it's always been about Ohio State football. My dad was a huge Woody Hayes fan. And on game day Saturdays, you know, he'd be back at the back of the store uh, in the meat counter, and my mom would always uh, warn me, says, you know, stay away from the back, <laughs> and the back, dad's mad about the game, 
You know, he's mad at Woody Hayes. He doesn't like the play calling, you know, and, and things. And, uh, and from that young age, though, him listening to the game on radio at the store was my early recollection. And, and Ohio State has been a big part of our family ever since. You go to high school. You were uh, one of how many Asian Americans in the? In oh, probably out of 1,200 students, there was. Uh, I was. I, I think I was one of two. Uh, eventually, there was a female who came in into high school. I think he was younger than I, and I always got the nudging from my friends. They said, "Hey, somebody for you to date." You know, somebody. <laughs> yeah, uh, like that. So, out of 1,200 kids, there was probably two of us. I'd love to hear some more details about you growing up, though, working at the store, you know, as a young kid. It must have been uh, an interesting time. It, it, it was an interesting time because, I mean, you know, basically, like I said, at age eight, I was probably, I started off my first job for my parents was sorting pop bottles, you know, the old pop bottles that, yeah. that people could return for, you know, for two cents uh, or something like that. And, and uh, so that's, that was my first job was to get all those in order so that the uh, cola companies could come pick it up and you know, pick up all the empties. And then later, uh, when I turned 10, you know, we took those pop bottle cases and turned them over and I used that as a stand to run the cash register. So folks would come through our store and they'd see this little guy there running this uh, cash register and, and collecting their money. So you, your mom and dad and your brother, are all, you're all working all, there in the all store? All working there in the store, yes. And uh, in front of the biggest candy counter in Clintonville. <laughs> and don't think that, I, that my brother and I didn't test out every candy that there was. When you go to school, were you razzed? You know, I, I, it was, it was um, for the most part, a great experience in, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, I had my friends. And, uh, but then, you know, you, you, had your, you had your folks who would pick on you and, and things. And, and uh, I was fortunate enough to have uh, a couple people just kind of watch out for me and, and be able to kind of protect me uh, from, the, from the bullying, from the harassment. So, friends of yours? Yeah, friends of mine who would uh, make sure that I was uh, taken care of in the hallway. What do, you, what do you do when you're in school? You're one of two in high school, yeah. Asian, then the other's a girl. The other's a girl. I mean, how, how do you function? How, how do you get along there with everybody? Well, I, you know, I, I had my group of friends, and, and, and playing sports helps. You know, you, you, get, you get part of labeled, uh, you know, a jocks, and you're part of that group. Mm -hmm. And so I was accepted as part of that. I mean, there was probably more uh, uh, black and white uh, tension going on in those days. In, in the early 70s uh, about uh, what was happening with race relations and things and I seemed to be accepted by both groups. I wasn't white nor black so I was, you know, I, I tended to be accepted by that so I didn't, I didn't have as much trouble but it also meant a lot of, uh, uh, of, of being alone and being on your own uh, because, um, you know, there weren't, there weren't that many folks that uh, uh, would welcome you into their house. Really? Yeah. Tell me about discrimination. Have you felt discrimination? Yeah, I, I think especially uh, when you're from an immigrant family, when you're a minority family, um, in a very blue collar white neighborhood. Uh, I mean, we, we had incidents uh, of that. I mean, you know, we grew up in a time when there was the uh, anti-Japanese sentiment uh, in regards to the automakers you know, Toyota and, and things like that. And, and so there was a lot of resentment by some of the blue collar workers uh, about that. And even though we were Chinese, uh, we still felt the effects of the anti-Asian uh, sentiment. What was your family like then in, in reacting to well, that? Well, I, you know, my family probably was, was very similar in that my, my parents uh, really only wanted us to associate with other Asians. Really? And, and so, um, even though we had our Caucasian friends and things, um, you know, we, we, in their mind, especially in my mother's mind, it was, it was uh, you know, we had to work. We had to, we had to support the family. We had to work in the store. And that was paramount. That was the most important thing. Did you feel you were middle class, lower middle class? Or how you did know, you feel you fit in with everybody? I, you know, that, I think that was the other stigma, the other part, is that we were not a very rich family. You know, we were, I, I wouldn't even call us middle class. I mean, you know, we were kind of barely making it. And, and, uh, and we survived. I mean, 
Uh, I wore St. Paris Jude for a long, long time. You know, I wore my brother's hand-me-downs for a long, long time. And, uh, and, but later on in high school and junior high, uh, as a junior and a senior like that, our, our fortunes turned a little better. Our business was better and more successful uh, because of my mom's entrepreneurial efforts and, and things. So we, you know, uh, I had a little bit more money on my own to go buy some clothes mm -hmm. and, and not have to wear hand-me-downs anymore. Did your parents really beat, beat on you to be something, you know, be a doctor I, I, or something I, I, like that? I think, I think they're, they're, they were like many, many of uh, the old uh, uh, immigrant type uh, parents who wanted, their, wanted absolute success for their children, you know, to be that doctor or that dentist, uh, whatever professional, you know. Um, my, my parents, though, you know, really were a little different in that they really wanted to see us uh, succeed in something and, and be successful uh, and passionate about uh, something that we love to do. And I think that was a difference maker. Um, you know, my older brother was able to pursue his love of art, and, and which eventually grew in advertising. I was able to pursue my love of sports and, and do the job I do. I mean, if you ask my mother today what I do for a living, I don't think she could probably tell anybody what I do for a living. <laughs> she, um, know. she just knows that it's in sports and it's with a college and a university. But, uh, but she's always been great, supportive, and, and, and things, just like my dad was when he was alive. And uh, my younger brother the same way with his love of finance. And, and so he's pursuing that today. How, how did your father feel about the life that he carved out in this country? Did he feel that he had hit a ceiling he couldn't get beyond, or was he happy about what? Uh, no, I, 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 I think um, I mean he has only known nothing but work. I mean, working in a hand laundry, working in a grocery store, uh, just trying to uh, do something for his family. I mean, uh, if there's one thing that my parents did for us was to make sure that we all got to go to college and get a degree. That was their main force in life, was to make sure that we all were able to go to Ohio State University and get a degree and, and go on in life. And they worked right up to the end. Uh, unfortunately, by the time my dad was able to retire, he, that's when he um, uh, found out that he uh, was, uh, was stricken with cancer. So you played sports uh, in high school. What part did your father play in your becoming what you are today, the man you are today? I think, you know, I've always had that love of playing sports, but I was certainly, I knew well enough that I wasn't going to be playing in college. And my, my father really helped me in terms of, uh, he sponsored, you know, I, I, right after high school, um, I was coaching summer league basketball. I um, uh, got picked up and I was an assistant coach at, at our rival high school um, and things. And, uh, and, and my dad helped sponsor those summer league teams. And, and he, kept, he kept following my interests. Uh, and in the end, the biggest decision had to do with my father. Um, he was ill at the time with cancer. And, and my older brother had already gone on. He was off in New York uh, working, already building his career, and I was the only one left in Columbus with my younger brother, and I felt an obligation while he was sick to run the family business. And, but when the baseball, my first job opportunity in sports really came along, and it was a minor league baseball job, you know, my dad pulled me aside and he said, he said, no, you're not gonna stay here. You're not going to work the family business. You're going to go pursue your dream. You're going to go to California and, 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 and be a baseball guy. So that was probably the most <coughs> significant moment as far as something that brought you to where you are today? Absolutely. It, it, it was about pursuing your dream. And with pursuing your dream with an absolute passion. And it kind of runs in our family. I mean, if you, if you take a look at my older brother, he pursued he went from an arts degree to advertising to becoming a major player in advertising, and now he's, he's Hall of Fame in, in advertising with what he's done. Let's talk about the sports career. You also, uh, <laughs> people probably don't know this, you worked at Bloomingdale's, had nothing to do with sports in That's New right. York City. Yeah. How did, did you like that? Well, I, you know, after, you know, I got my start in minor league baseball and, and then with the Cleveland Indians. And, 
Um, and, and then I broke away and I, and I, I was offered an opportunity for double the pay uh, to work at Bloomingdale's as a senior operations manager and, and live in New York. I was a single guy at the time. Single guy in New York. Yeah, single guy in New York <laughs> in, a, in an apartment four blocks away from, you know, from Bloomingdale's. Yeah. Well, you know, it was a great place to be. But? But retail is retail. I mean, I went through two Christmases there and, and uh, it can, hard work. it's very hard work. Very hard work, and, and I, I miss sports. You miss sports. Yes, I do. And what happened then? I uh, literally went back to Ohio State, uh, entered into the master's program for athletic administration there, and uh, literally went back to New York, quit my job, and, and, and went back to pursue my master's. Why do you love sports? I mean, what's in it for you? What, what do you feel about there's, it? There's a love, and, and I got it from playing. You know, when I was playing basketball, playing baseball or something there was just that love of sport um, there's there's nothing like the purity of, of being able to play a sport to play it be part of a team um, to win um, all of those things are, are, are just just I, I'm just passionate about playing a sport and that's what drove me to being in sports you're a tweeter all the time almost every day I see something tweet and some of them uh, I'm trying to remember them I my favorite one is, I think it applies here, in the midst of chaos lies opportunity. Absolutely. Is that how you feel about your situation? It's absolutely opportunity. Um, in, in, in the midst of all this chaos, there is absolutely, I saw a lot about great opportunity here uh, to build this program, uh, to return it to its glory. What do you think when you come to Hawaii? I, I don't know how many times you've been here before you've made that recruiting trip out here. Had you been here before? I've been here as a visitor. Yeah, you know, I've been yeah. here as a vacationer. My, yeah. you know, my wife and I have been here a number of times. I always like to ask people, what is your impression of Hawaii when you first come here? And, and now that you've been here a while, tell me about it. Such a beautiful place for even just being on an island. It's such a beautiful place to be. Uh, the people are just so warm and wonderful. And I've, I've uh, you know, that, that has been tremendous to me, uh, especially since my arrival here in this position. I mean, people have been welcoming, uh, wanting to help, uh, wanting to be part of the program. Um, and, that was, and that's been true every time I come here. The, 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 the people uh, just welcome you like Ohana here, and, and I like that. What, what's going to happen? You're still an outsider, though. Yes, I am. You, know, you could be here 30 years, you'll still be an outsider yep. <laughs> sometimes. Yep. What do you think will help you to, to understand the people here, to have them understand you? What, what is the chief asset that you think you have that's going to work for you? I think, I, I think my strongest suit is the fact that I communicate and I love talking to people and, and I like to get them to know me. And, and then, but I also take the time to understand them. Uh, part, of, part of what I've done here in the first few uh, 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 since I've, my arrival here is the fact that I, I wanted to get to know how things work here, the people, how it happens here, uh, what makes them tick, you know, and because if I understand that, then I, then I can understand how I can work better here and live better here. What in your past, your experiences at, at Ohio State or uh, the Cleveland Indians or minor league baseball or Bloomingdale's, what's going to help you the most here out of all that experience that you've the, 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 the biggest thing that I've learned in this business is you have to listen. You have to listen to the people, you have to listen to the staff uh, and, and, and hear what they're saying and, and then be able to help uh, drive what you need to do in order, in order to make uh, a positive difference here. You must have seen thousands of games. Uh, is, is there one that stands yeah. out for you? Yeah, there, there obviously are two and they're obviously both tied to my father. Um, there, to me, uh, the 1985 opening day, Cleveland Indians, Cleveland Municipal Stadium. And my father is well enough to travel to come up to Cleveland and, and sit behind home plate and, and know that his son is the guy in charge, in charge of the game that day, in charge of the stadium. And, and uh, he had never been to an Indians game before. And it was uh, a, a great day and a wonderful experience for him. Uh, second one was probably uh, the last time he was able to see an Ohio State game. Ninth, uh, number one, Iowa, at home against Ohio State, and I was able to get tickets. 
and my dad and I sat there in the stands in the rain um, as, as Ohio State defeated number one Iowa uh, in Ohio Stadium. Um, he, he, he would never stop talking about that game. And then he, of course, himself remembers the 1950 snowball game I got <laughs> between Ohio State and Michigan. Remind people what that was. Yes, yeah, well, <laughs> quite the blizzard in Ohio Stadium uh, of the biggest rivalry game of the year. And uh, it was just, you know, I think there were probably, even though that, that stadium seats 100,000 people, there's probably 300,000 people that claim that they were there. Like that. And, uh, and Ohio State lost that game on a field goal. So. What's the job like in reality versus what you thought it was going to be when you took it? I have to admit, it was quite a surprise. There's uh, much more work to do uh, than I anticipated. Um, I knew uh, reading the reports uh, from the audits and, and reading uh, what happened during Wonder Blunder that uh, we had some corrections to do internally in terms of the way we do business. But I, 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 it is, uh, I think the surprise for me was the condition of our facilities. I think the uh, condition of our budget and, and uh, how financially uh, critical it was right now to try and do something about turning it around. Uh, this department was already facing a, a, a double-digit uh, deficit, and we had to do something about relieving ourselves of, of that burden. Uh, you've obviously had uh, good success at Ohio State, but I think you've had a few problems. Uh, the Cleveland Indians were not exactly <laughs> the roaring success <laughs> in your days. <laughs> no, they weren't. They weren't. What did they was draw? A, what, 600,000? They, uh, they drew 665,000 people for the entire season after drawing 68,000 people for opening day. Okay. They averaged 8,000 fans a game in, in cavernous uh, Cleveland Municipal Stadium. So you didn't uh, have the terrific success there, but it must have taught the, you something. There wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot of people to watch. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and no, but uh, it, it, it taught me a great deal about working with people. Um, I think, you know, we were, we were having a labor strike at the time, and, and, and you have to learn uh, basically about what it is working with the workers the common workers in the stadium and, and understand where they're coming from. And, and so we, it, it was a great training experience for me. How important is humility in your job, you think? And is it, is it more important out here? I, I, I've always had the sense that to be humble was a greater virtue in Hawaii than it was practically oh, in any other I, place. I, How do you feel about I that? I totally agree. I totally agree. You can't, you can't be all that is what I say. You know, you, you have to uh, be humble. Uh, about what you're doing here and and uh, and who you are, uh, we're all in this together. We're all one ohana. Um, even uh, even as I take things back from uh, my prior experiences of being a team member, you know, we can't get what we need done without being part of a family and doing it as a family. Then you get this uh, this complaint from some people. Oh, we need somebody local. We don't need an outsider. We we should get somebody local. What's the pros and cons there from your standpoint? I think, I, I think the pros and cons, one of the things that I bring to this job is my past experience and the vast amount of, of, of expertise I bring to the job. I've done many things, I've worn many hats, and I think I bring that experience and expertise to the job uh, that somebody else probably doesn't have uh, if, they, if, uh, uh, if they haven't had that, that kind of benefit that I've had. Um, I've done all kinds of things in this business, uh, from marketing to ticketing to facility management to construction to you name it. I mean, I came from a position at Ohio State where I built 16 construct. Uh, we had 16 uh, facility projects in six years. I mean, unheard of. But you know what? Working with our team, uh, we were able to get that done. You're going through sweating whatever thousands of fans in this in this state have gone through in this place and I know I, I want to give you a minute as we wrap this up uh, to tell me your plans for uh, for this place for Clum. Clum Jim as I walked around this facility is, is an incredibly historical uh, place in the heart of Hawaii athletics uh, I can't tell you how many times fans have come to me and say oh I remember being in Clum Jim watching basketball game, watching volleyball game, uh, registering for classes in Clum Gym. You know, there were many who said that. 
And, but when I walked in here and see uh, the condition of it, um, it saddens me. And I want to bring it back to life. I want to fix this place up. But I also want to bring it back to help our teams win. And the way we're going to do that is uh, I want to renovate Clum. I'm going to turn it into, a, on one side, a sport performance center. Basically, weight room, cardio, all, all you know, what our teams really need in terms, of, in terms of getting better. And on the other side, a dedicated practice facility for our basketball and women's, uh, our, our volleyball teams. And, uh, and, and to give them a place uh, that they can hone their skills, not only just during a couple hours a day, but that, that the individual student athletes can come in here and work on their game. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you man. Let's see. In the midst of chaos rises opportunity. Opportunity. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great. Whew.